Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to, in this session, be talking about um, the theme of Together in relation to cultural architecture. Um, Alice Deitch, who's a director at Amanda Levitt Architects in London, uh, has worked on uh, multiple cultural buildings. And I suppose for the purposes of this festival, uh, the most notable um, product of the practice is the Mart Centre, which is down on the water, uh, let me think, that way. And it's well worth a visit if you have the time while you're at the festival. It's a wonderful waterside building. And of course, what I think we became very conscious of during the pandemic was that when concert halls shut, when museums shut, um, and, and whether a whole range of buildings were no longer available to us, actually uh, watching symphonies on television or not going to museums but looking at objects from their archive on the screen, uh, al although it was kind of entertaining in lockdown, uh, was a far from ideal condition. And the whole point, of course, about cultural buildings is, is that are, they are concentrations of people sharing collective experience, even though there may be moments of individual experience. I mean, you look at a painting in an art gallery, but actually there could be 10,000 people in that gallery that afternoon. That changes the context in which you experience the building and the architecture, and I suppose indeed the art. So we're delighted to have this session and please welcome Alice Deitch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, I need the clicker here. Right, yeah, yes. Okay, so together in Lisbon, that's what you told me when you called me Flint, uh, Paul and, and told me what, if I wanted to join the festival and that sounded somehow familiar, this idea of together in Lisbon. Um, and this is uh, the, the mat which you just mentioned, uh, which opened in 2016. Uh, and that was the day of the opening where almost 80,000 people, which is almost 15% of the population of Lisbon, came to congregate on the roof and on, along the riverfront. It's now one of the most visited museums in, in Portugal, even though it doesn't have a collection. Uh, it's a place that is designed around the movement of people, around bringing people together, around that very desire to uh, to be together, and from many directions, many different backgrounds in that extraordinary place that didn't really exist as such uh, before. So we bring people from the north, we bring people from the south along the river, but we also bring people from on the other side of the, the city, the other side of the, the road and the train tracks where we've identified a little um, a square in the neighborhood that we could connect with a bridge that would span over the, the train and the, and the cars to land on the roof of the, of the museum. And maybe that very move of connecting with just that thread, that, that stroke of a pen, if you want, the museum uh, to the city and, and make it land on the roof together with a movement of people along the river was probably what uh, gave the, the very uh, massing and the very shape of the, the building or the definition of it uh, as a starting point. But perhaps what it didn't do was as much as or as important as what we did do. And what we didn't do is we didn't build as high as we could and we didn't build as much as we could. And that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive. We sunk the building below the water table, counterintuitive for uh, gallery spaces, of course. And uh, but but that allows to preserve the views from the city onto uh, the river. And that very move um, place equal value, if you want, between the city and the landscape at the front, between the, the built uh, scape at the back and, and the sort of natural river uh, at the front. The roof of the museum becomes a sort of elevated town square at the threshold between those two worlds. In this aerial view, you very much see how the movement of People have shaped the massing of the building and, and people coming from the river, how we extend to the city and how the, we also extend the park that starts behind the, the Tejo uh, power station, which is an integral part of the museum, onto the roof of the building by taking the, the, the greenscape on, onto the, the rear of the, of the building. 
So this is approaching from the Tejo station on a, on a sunny day. Hopefully there's sun tomorrow if some of you want to come and see this. Uh, and this is approaching from the riverside, uh, climbing up the building and onto the roof uh, to really just propose a place to, to be and be together, exchange, regroup um, uh, and enjoy this very special site. You don't necessarily need much programming to bring people together um, when you have such an exceptional site. Uh, here, the Lisboetans um, sit and meet together and look back at the city and, and enjoy what they have. It's a destination that really has been appropriated by, by everyone and uh, is a very sort of democratic one. The moves that we've made outside to draw people in very much continue inside the building to get people into the gallery spaces, uh, it's a museum, into, into that big uh, first uh, art space, a space for big art. Here it's shown with the, uh, an, uh, an installation by uh, Hector Zamora. Uh, and from here you continue to lead with the same flow of movement into the other galleries. And in this way, by that sort of seamless journey, we connect the three disciplines that the museum are about, uh, architecture, technology, and, and art uh, in a sort of uh, continuous journey. This is the gallery below ground. It's lit by uh, a skylight at the front. And when you come up close to the skylight, you see the sky and look back at the, the facade, which sort of overhang uh, towards the, the river. And that very big move of overhanging the facade um, help us to manipulate the light that falls into the, the gallery spaces below ground. So it's somehow that light, that very special light that you have by the, by the river, uh, bounce onto the, the facade and into the gallery spaces. You also see in this section the very, uh, a lot of the sustainable moves that we've made to, uh, to design this building. Uh, the first one being the, the large uh, cantilever that self-shade self the front of the, the museum. Uh, you also see the, the sort of walkway uh, that, longs around, that runs along the facade and where um, a, a breeze that comes from the river pre-cooled the building. You see the sunken gallery that uh, benefit from the thermal mass uh, of, the, um, of the earth around it. And there's also, through that shape, some unexpected moments, which I wish I could say we could redesign them, but they kind of happened by accident or an ex a happy accident, as we would say. Uh, and when you stand at the top of the steps of the, the overhanging roof, almost acts as a reflector of sound and you hear the echo of the wave, the same way that the light is bouncing into the gallery. Our focus also here was uh, the waterfront and how we, key, how we can make a place to sit closer by the river, by the water. And so we designed those steps that are slowly uh, descending onto the water uh, for, for people to sit down in the shade and enjoy uh, the presence of the museum, maybe venture further into the gallery, meet people and discover uh, the facade of the building is, is very, very long, so to, we gave a grain and a sort of human scale uh, by designing three-dimensional three -dimensional, three -dimensional ceramic tiles that um, are mapped on, along the facade and pick up the light in different, light, in, in different conditions and sort of articulate the, the facade, give some shadow, give some texture to it. And we did that in a... In a pretty pragmatic way by uh, designing three tiles that could take the shape, that could vary with the shape of the, of the building itself. Uh, the first one is a the sort of standard three-dimensional tile, which is then edged by a transitional tile and, and finished by a, an edge tile that, that becomes flat and deal with the junctions. There's a very rich tradition in Portugal of, of crafts, uh, of ceramic crafts, and and um, and uh, yeah, and so we wanted to continue that. That that felt like a natural thing to a natural material to use on that site, and so to add a depth to the fifteen thousand tiles, then we. Um, um, uh, we use a crackle glaze, uh, which is uh, an old technique uh, from the, uh, that dates back from the Song Dynasty in China, which was, I think, an accident in the kiln, uh, but that has been replic replicated for that, uh, that 
feel of fragility and um, so that's something that we wanted to to bring up close to that to that building we use a natural color because you see the color is given by the changing of the light and we in the glaze we uh, used um, a, a little um, mineral called inamite that gives a sort of metallic grain to the facade and, and pick up a sort of speckle metallic effect. We did loads of research with specialist um, uh, ceramicists to, uh, to get to the, the simplicity of, of this style. And here you see what happened in the summer, in the sunset, when literally the building turns on fire and, and get this sort of extraordinary glow. And at other times, uh, dusk, for instance, yeah, it looks a lot more blue and, and gray and, and, and yellow. And it's ever changing, really, that uh, it's, it's a building that feels alive, that feels uh, that you want to go back to, you want to um, uh, return. And I think that's also part of that what we need to give for people to be together and come back together to museum it's it's something that feels always new and and maybe that's this uh, aspect of the building which is always changing that maybe gives permission to the visitor to uh, appropriate it and and here we see those uh, artists or musicians playing uh, literally on the facade But as you said, uh, Paul, museums are, are places for exchange. And uh, um, at the V&A, the our brief was to bring new audiences um, and to to reach to di a different um, public. And so the original way into the museum is that grand entrance just off Cromwell Road. It's a very busy busy road, uh, and the entrance is up a set of steps, which is maybe you know a traditional museum uh, offering and uh, approach and we wanted to uh, create something that would bring an element of informality uh, to the approach and, and entering the very fact of entering the museum. Uh, this is the team of, of engineers uh, and architects that designed the building in uh, 1863. I mean, this photograph is from 1863. And the, so in this project, a lot of progress were made in, in more than one. Uh, this is uh, us with war engineers uh, 150 years later in the exact same place. And this project is very much, and I think that happens a lot in cultural projects, uh, a project of collaboration and mutual respect and exchange to get to a, to a solution, uh, especially in a project like this that was so challenging from an engineering point of view. It's also collaboration together with artisans and, and technicians and craftsmanship to get to something that uh, would be very unique to the museum. Uh, the, the Victorian Albert Museum is um, a didactic museum of arts and craft, and so we wanted to get to that very ethos in the fabric that we were adding to the existing building or in re realizing that. So we started collaborations with many, many uh, manufacturers uh, from metal worker to uh, tile manufacturers, ceramicists, uh, stonemasons, and exchanged with them, started a conversation together, uh, and together bring this, those conversations a step further. This was the site that we uh, inherited after we won the competition. It's, uh, it was a backyard, if you want, where you had um, plant rooms and, and storage spaces. Uh, and this is Exhibition Road going from Hyde Park to South Kensington. Uh, it's a, a road that links three major museums, the Victoria and Albert, the Science Museum, and uh, also at the north you have the Royal Hubbertal Natural History Museum and the uh, Imperial College. But yet there was no, so that, that road marked here in blue was connecting all those uh, big institutions, but with no, um, no possibility to get of that main drag. Um, so, and the street had been newly pedestrianized, so we saw an opportunity here to open up that side and to take the street into the museum and take the museum onto the street. And in this way, we would uh, create that new relationship, engage with new audiences, and create a different approach than the one that existed on Cromwell Road. But to do this, there was this uh, huge barrier to overcome. The, the Aston web screen that was hiding the site or, or facing onto Exhibition Road. Uh, and that was originally built to hide the bowlers that were inside or behind the screen, but that had, no, uh, that had gone uh, a long time ago. 
Uh, so we argued that to for the success of that entrance to work, uh, this screen required uh, a great alteration and, and increased transparency. So and its longer its purpose was no longer to hide the the museum that was behind, but instead to reveal it, to frame views of it, to reveal those facades that were behind, to, to reveal a place that was an outdoor room of the museum. And to win the argument of changing that piece of grade one listed uh, structure, we looked hard in the, um, uh, in the V&A archive and found this drawing of the original Aston Wet design where you could see here the, the screen which uh, exists, I mean, was drawn also at the time, was much lower. And in plan, you could see that behind the screen there was uh, a garden and an invitation to, uh, to get in. What happened is during construction, the Aston Web screen, the Aston Web scheme ran out of money, as it happens uh, sometimes, and the ballroom were, that were designed to go under, an underground insta, instead were put above ground, and Aston Web changed the design of the screen to raise the, the parapet and, and hide the bowlers that were now uh, visible. So we won that argument with, uh, with the understanding of that history of, of the screen and, and that original intent of Aston Webb with, with this building. And uh, it's this very big move of bringing transparency between and porosity between the streets and the courtyard that unlocked the potential of the, pro the project to create uh, a new space, a new uh, room of the V&A um, uh, for, for the public to enjoy just off Exhibition Road. So we took down walls as well, or transform windows into entrances to create a new way in uh, and to light the, the light into the, the building. But this was far from straightforward because below the courtyard was the brief for the gallery space uh, the, for the main exhibition, which then uh, required the, crea the creation of that big basement spaces uh, um, uh, that was up against the facade. So we had to pile up against the facade. Uh, and usually deep basements are either held by slab uh, or uh, there's a built building on top of it that sort of push back the earth pressure. Uh, but here we had none of that. We just had that lightweight courtyard. So um, what was became quite interesting is Cambridge, Cambridge using University, who works closely with Arab, the engineer that you saw in the picture before, um, were quite taken by the structural audacity of this, uh, this project and they decided to monitor the movement of, uh, in the, with fiber optic in the tension pile to, uh, to see if that could, and by recording it, to see if they could disprove some aspect of the, um, the elastic theory on, on how it is calculated. And so maybe without realizing it or, or especially wanted it, we, we may have advanced a little bit uh, engineering knowledge. And, and I think that's uh, also something which is important in cultural building, how you can um, uh, make progress and uh, um, create collaborations that are unexpected. To connect the gallery below ground, we had to pile uh, or underpin an existing wing of the museum uh, and to keep it open uh, to the public at the same time. And this was an essential move so that the museum, the extension of the museum wouldn't feel like an annex, but it would com completely be rooted into or knitted or woven, if you want, into uh, the existing building. And so the columns that you see here are literally bearing the, the load or the weight of history. Uh, and at the bottom of the, the stair, you get uh, the daylight so that you don't have the feeling that you've been going 15 meters uh, below ground. So once you're there, this is the main event, the gallery spaces, which span from both sides of, uh, of the courtyard. Uh, we used the folded plate structure uh, to span the 40 meters so that we could maximize the headroom in the gallery space and give a, a feeling of a space that was higher than, than it is. Uh, and to also contain all the equipments that the museum uh, needs for creating their immersive shows. We've also left an opportunity for daylight to come in the gallery. Also, they don't use it uh, very often, but that's something that was uh, important to not miss that opportunity to bring daylight through. And 
uh, it's now all together a much more informal way of entering the museum. Uh, we place the cafe in the sun. There's this Oculus that gives a view below ground uh, into the gallery spaces. It's like a museum vitrine. We frame view off to, onto Exhibition Road and we get a new way to experience the museum. And we wanted to give to that uh, courtyard a, a very special uh, feel, something that spoke of the, the V&A uh, and, and gave a relationship between below and above. Um, uh, and so that we somehow made visible what was invisible uh, below the courtyard. And to do this, we used uh, the structure of the gallery and flatten it if you want to create uh, a courtyard pattern made of uh, only a couple of tiles. Uh, and that would create that surface that uh, um, takes you down into into the, the the entrances. A lot of our inspiration was taken from uh, the gallery collection themselves uh, and the porcelain collection in particular. And we worked with Tischler to create those tiles, uh, that the ceramic tiles that uh, or the porcelain tiles, sorry, that uh, cover the courtyard. That came about after um, many um, many hours of research with them, with uh, factories in the north of England, with uh, factories in, in uh, Limoges as well, to get to the point of, of that sleep cast tile that was uh, produced. So that's this exchange uh, that was important uh, to produce these beautiful tiles where the glaze of the uh, pools in the grooves of the tile and then create that, uh, that pattern, the fact that blur the threshold between jointing and, and pattern. And the, the porcelain really lights up the, the whole courtyard and the, this whole space and, and lift the earthy color of the heritage facade. And there's another paradox here which made us work with other manufacturers. The, uh, we had opened the, the screen, but we had to close it at night. And everything we were trying to design to close the, the gate was either too um, common or, or too opaque. So we really got the clue for them on when we got this survey drawing of the screen itself, which we had ordered to be able to dismantle the, the, the entire screen to gain access to the site. Uh, and in this drawing, you see uh, the sh sharpened Schnapp, uh, sharp and da damage of the World War II um, bombing. And so that is something that we were going to partially remove with the alteration to the screen. So it felt that it was important to memorialize. So in the gates of the, the, the new gates that we've designed, we've imprinted through perforation at an angle the motif of that topography that was revealed by the, by the survey of the, the screen. And you see it uh, in certain lights where you start to map the, the contour of those uh, damage. And then uh, in the front, you continue to, uh, to see through the, the courtyard uh, and the transparency is, is pres preserved. There was a, um, a note on the wall that was existing to memorialize this, uh, the damage of the World War II. And so we uh, extended the note or continued it by uh, telling the story of the gates. There was also a royal crest above the existing entrance, which we then uh, in the same way memorialized uh, to the entrance to remind the visitor that was uh, a right, an appointment by uh, uh, or the origin of the museum, really. So it both speaks of tradition, it, it hasn't lost that, but it also um, speaks of the way public can come and use the courtyard and, and, um, and that's been quite transformative for the museum. I think it has changed the um, opinion of the public about the museum and, and maybe it has changed also a little bit the way the institution see itself. And I think that, fi that picture very much speak of, um, of being together and having that private moment at the same time. Next project is Maggie's Care Center. Um, you probably know about uh, Maggie's. Uh, it goes at the very art of architecture. It's about creating spaces that are uplifting, calming, and, and lighten up your mood. And this was our site uh, at the Southampton Hospital. There's no historic context here, just uh, a car park, a sea of car park. 
And our solution was to bring a bit of magic to the place. We wanted to imagine that there was one day a piece of the new forest here that we could recreate by uh, de-asphalting the, the car park and, and placing, uh, returning back to nature uh, and carving in that nature a uh, space for, for the building. The plan of the building is very, is very simple. There's four rooms uh, that uh, are there for uh, exchange and, and privacy and four walls that lead, to, lead you to a central um, space from everything and everything sort of radiates around it and, and everything is then surrounded by nature. We use ceramic again here by uh, Kumela, the same people that did the Lisbon tile. Um, and uh, it's a material that comes from the earth. And we thought that that was a, a really beautiful complementary with uh, nature. The ceramic blades lead, leads you into that central space where you can exchange with uh, patients and, and families about what you're going through. Uh, and share your experiences, and but you can also be off the central space in, in more private places without with always having a view of the garden and never seeing the car park uh, beyond. So it's a plan that works really well because it's allowing you to be together in the central space, but also to be by yourself uh, without being alone. Uh, so you know that that sort of just notion of a uh, fine threshold of not feeling alone. Uh, the ceramic walls sometimes uh, become shelf, and here they hold uh, a poetry collection by Edmund Devar. Um, and each ceramic blade is of a slightly different color, and sometimes uh, it's just the color of the clay. We use ceramic structurally to support the roof. So again, that speaks of the collaboration that we, we did with engineers and, and manufacturers. Uh, so, so that the, the ceramic themselves became the cast of the, the walls and uh, supported the timber roof and, and the green roof. And learning from our experience in Lisbon, we've let the material speak uh, with the shadow uh, of the, the trees and, and the, uh, the color of the sun. As much as possible, we wanted the building to literally disappear or feel like it had been grown out of, of the site, this new site that we had created and, and bring us some sense of well-being for uh, people to, uh, when they come to, to Maggie's. Uh, there's a very nice relationship between the trees and, and the building. And we used uh, a stainless steel ripple surface to sort of give a new uh, or different uh, reading of, of the landscape that is uh, an amplified maybe uh, that is around it uh, and it also captures beautifully the sun. This is Belgrade, um, the Philharmonic Hall, Concert Hall, which uh, commission, uh, in a competition we've just won recently and um, this is probably the biggest cultural investment in the region for a decade. Uh, so it's a very important project that will message um, Serbia's pro progressive uh, vision for the future. It's an important site. We're here at the threshold or at the confluence between two rivers, the, the Danube River and the Sava River, which you see on, on the right. We're also just in between Old Belgrade, the Soviet uh, city on the south, and the um, uh, sorry, the New Belgrade, and then Old Belgrade, which is the more vernacular uh, old town, which is overlooking the site. We're just next to the Palace of People, which you see here on the left in this image. So it's a, a strategic place where everything comes together: all those culture, all those influences, all um, the nature and the built, the the people, the past and the future. Uh, and we want the, the concert to be a place for reconciliation of all those um, uh, influences. Our well, starting point was the exceptional sites uh, and the landscape of the Danube, which is just there uh, behind us. Uh, the, the river, uh, also in the middle of the river, there's uh, Great War Island, which is a piece of wilderness still, uh, which is, is quite powerful in itself. And we had we felt that we had the responsibility to honor this untouched piece uh, of nature. Um, uh, and so we did that by replanting the site and extending that nature onto the site and, and replanting the Uske Park, which is in between the river and our site. Uh, and in this way, we could bring nature really up close the concert hall. Uh, 
uh, and and transform making a real transformation from for the city beyond just the venue uh, a new park a new uh, place uh, a cleaner city a greener city a more sustainable city the site uh, was the the birthplace of the Vinca civilization, uh, which uh, had there their first dwelling, and they were grouped uh, around a central space or a common area. Uh, the site is also sort of halfway between east and west, or equidistant between Vienna and Istanbul. Uh, it's also at the epicenter between Old Belgrade, New Belgrade, the new district. So it's there, it's got that sort of centrality intensity. It feels like every everything could come, um, or all those horizons could come together on that side. And the brief is for four venues, a concert hall, a recital hall, a podium and a studio. Uh, so we place those four venues uh, in a central arrangement around a shared space. Uh, and in this way, by doing that, we could bring nature really up close to the building and we could let people enter from all sides. There was not one entrance, but could arrive from all directions. The social space is... Um, so the social space in the, in the middle is a place of changing tempo. Uh, it's a place that works well when it's quiet and it needs to be working well uh, as well when it's uh, busy. It's, it's kind of... It's both a vibrant town square and a clearing the forest. Uh, it's a place to exchange and hang out before or after an event, or even if you're not going to an event, it needs to be a place where you can just be. Then we've looked at um, giving the building an expression of harmony. Um, we've looked at music, we've looked at harmonics, at uh, rhythm and melodies, and we uh, the, even at the movement of the baton and, and define a sort of veil that drape the four venue and drape, create a, a roof to that social space in the middle um, and, and keep that sort of poetry of music and the delicacy of, of music and, and sounds. So the harmony is between, between uh, landscape and nature, between uh, material and immaterial. Uh, here, we, the lake captures the reflection of the building and the big building captures the reflection of the, uh, of the sky and, and the sun. The veil is made of a hundred of or hundred or, or thousands of um, recycled glass tiles that give this sort of immaterial effect or, or quality rather, um, particularly at night where uh, parts of the hall will be activated or, or, or be more uh, in uh, or less activated and, and is uh, gives the vibrancy or, or almost a reading of like breathing of what's happening inside the, the venues. And music and architecture are a great symbol of culture and community, and uh, and we set out to give form to that. And I th we think that this drawing is uh, convey that intention. It sees the building as an expression of harmony between east and west, between nature and building, between old and new, between generations, and between music, different music jaws. This is as you, as you approach the main entrance or one of the entrance um, uh, from the forest. Uh, you don't see everything at once, and, 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 but you're attracted by the, the hall. Uh, this is the artist's entrance, which works exactly the same way, but maybe uh, in a more private way. Uh, and the podium entrance or venue, which opens up onto uh, an open field uh, for a very different experience and celebration. The space in between uh, leads to uh, other leads from one venue to another, and are also poetic and, and beautiful. Um, and this is the hall, the restal hall in timber. It's about warmth and richness, and maybe nature and the music instrument. Uh, and the shape of the balconies uh, gives a definition to the acoustics. The concert hall is very different. It's instead of timber, it's a white stone that Belgrade is famous for. Uh, it feels, it makes it feel more rooted to the city uh, and belonging to everyone. And maybe it's a nice slide to conclude on because it, it speaks to what you uh, intro on, uh, Paul, the, um, the sense of being together uh, in a place that uh, feels democratic. And uh, it speaks of the collaboration that are yet to come between us uh, and together with all the people that will contribute to this project in a way or another. 
it spills of the collaboration of the musicians that can only do music together. Um, and uh, it speaks also of never that sense of being together, but also uh, being by yourself uh, without feeling alone. Thank you. Uh, Alice, thank you very much for that. Um, some lovely work, both built and uh, yet to come. I'm always interested in what one goes to architects' offices and sort of, as it were, the research area tends to be about all the things about materials and structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I wonder to what extent um, in your office you take research about sort of people's behaviour and, and how you look into that, for example, you know, how people behave in space and to what extent the architecture can be directional or uh, is, is, that a, is, the, is that a big thing for the practice, actually? Uh, yeah, I think it is, but it's maybe less visible. I mean, you can't really uh, stack people in a in in a in a library uh, like you can do with with research with material research that you can that is very palpable. Um, but we, I think, we like to you know we always see ourselves as um, starting a project with a conversation, not a sketch. Uh, so I guess that speak of of that of how we will exchange with the people that will use the building, uh, how we've exchanged with, uh, with Maggie's to understand how pe why people will come here. Uh, and that's only when we get to that conversation that we probably built a narrative from it. Uh, and, and then we always get back to those stories. So we like to tell ourselves stories that we can um, continue to uh, write as we, as we develop projects. Because it, it's notoriously difficult to speak to users that you don't really know who they're going to be. Um, and you sort of kind of take on trust what the, what the client says the users want or will feel or will do. Yeah. But I suppose the sort of architect's role is partly to challenge that. I was thinking, for example, um, the, the differences between, say, the directional design in the Mart Centre as opposed to the actually you can use any entrance you want and find your own way at the V&A, for example. Yeah. And I think that that's extremely interesting. And I assume that that comes from um, the, the desire of the client in one instance to have a clear, as it were, processional route and a sequence of gallery spaces. Whereas at the V&A, um, the desire was to have a kind of transformational thing about how how the building felt. And part of that was to stop the idea of the enfilade where you inevitably had to yeah. move from one thing to other. You could negotiate it in different ways. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, a lot of it comes also quite simply from our own experiences. Uh, we usually don't work on projects that we don't feel close to it or that we would not completely relate to it. So part of that is our own experience and, and what's our intuitions of how things should should work then it's listening to 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 client and other users uh, i remember that just before the vna we were working on a project for le louvre to reorganize they uh they welcome um under the pyramid and we uh proposed to uh shut the pyramid and enter uh from the old palace all around it and uh, and we thought that was a brilliant idea. Then the pyramid could become that fantastic space where you could sit under a bit like you know the courtyard or the rooftop of Matt. Um, but uh, that was not the way the French wanted to do it. So that you know that there's always an element of of listening and an element of 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 trying with your own experience and your own intuitions. Because that experience, I mean, I think it would be fair to say that almost all the architects in this room are consumers of culture generally. I mean, architects do go to galleries and they do go to <laughs> concerts and they do go to museums. So you have a sort of starting point from your own 
from your own individual experience. Yeah, yeah. And, but, and you keep learning. I mean, that's what's exciting, no? Uh, you, you, we, we know more about music uh, this year than we knew last year, uh, uh, and how acoustic works. And 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 that's that's what's so interesting with cultural project and and public project is is you get all those all those other um, interests that uh, come into the mix and then we form the, the project or shape the proposals. I suppose two more questions. One is whether you ever use um, those uh, research people who do um, studies in actually how people move through space, people like Space Syntax, who made their reputations really when developers decided that they were telling the truth. <laughs> And they started using them to see, well, how would people behave in a shopping centre or going through a new kind of regeneration area? Do you ever do you ever use those sorts of people? We we did on the V&A. We did to uh, to prove a point more than to study uh, to because the V&A is once you've passed the threshold of the existing building, it's so. Uh, contentious or you know you're you're going from small room to another small room, so. We did verify, in a way, our proposal through modeling to understand that the entrance hall that we were proposing was indeed big enough. Uh, um, but I find it quite fascinating to be able to uh, to, uh, to to model that. I would love to, or I know we would all love in the office to work on a on a stadium or on a larger venue where where it is even more so about uh, the movement of people and and how you can cater an, an experience through uh, a journey of of visit. Uh, final question. There's a great controversy uh, in London at the moment because um, the National Gallery extension by Venturi Scott Brown, which is not a terribly old building, um, but it, it now serves as the main entrance to the whole of the National Gallery because the 19th century one is, uh, is improper because you can only reach it by stairs. So that can't be, the, you know, that's that's not architecturally correct anymore so in effect the venturi scott brown building which wasn't designed to be this has become the main entrance it's now being remodeled because the view is as a main entrance it's unsatisfactory and uh new york architect seldorf have made a proposal which is caused a huge fuss in london riba presidents writing to complain uh, about uh, uh, desecrating the work of Venturi Scott Brown is an enormous row in the newspapers and um, and and the cultural uh, commentaries. Uh, and yet, you look at this and you think, well, actually, in a way, the quantity of people that that needs to deal with, mm -hmm. the criticism that it's a bit like an airport lounge, you might take it as a compliment. Um, rather than the criticism. And the only question is, is it a well-designed uh, airport lounge? Now, in some of the work that, that you show, there are spaces, I think particularly the, the V&A, but also the environs of, of uh, Mars, where clearly this, this issue, I think, uh, has arisen, which is what makes that space kind of cultural space mm -hmm. um, What's the difference between a great piece of public space as opposed to a great piece of cultural public space? I mean, you know, in, in the end, are we too snooty, do you think, about cultural buildings saying, well, everything's got to be completely diff different about them because it's cultural? Because my feeling looking at your work is that not your attitude and what mm -hmm. you want them to be is kind of just great spaces in general. Yeah, yeah. I think we want our our project to be democratic, uh, and and that has no sort of um, sector limit. You know, you can be democratic, which means public in a proper, broad sense of things, in a cultural building or, or another. Um, just to get back on the entrance sort of point, uh, I think if you the idea of creating many diff many entry points, which I think you see in, in all of our project, is probably to avoid the uh, airport lounge effect because you disseminate that and and you get you get right there to the uh, visceral experience of culture, of art, or of um, music as as soon as you uh, push the door. 
uh, and that that door we try to uh, to blur that threshold. I think the uh, we see cultural places, museum as a continuum of the public space. Uh, so there should be no uh, threshold. Yeah, that that the, the public space, whether it's cultural or or sports, uh, sh should should feel public. A very nice note to end on. Alice Deesh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.